To create a new room for your game, you can click on the Resource drop-down menu and select Create Room, which is shift Control r Or you can click on the Create a Room icon on the toolbar, or you can right-click on the folder in your resource tree and click Create Room. Once you do, you'll be presented with a Room Properties window. This might look a little complex, so we'll break it down step by step. At the top, we have the toolbar. The first icon will close this window and save any changes. The second icon will undo any changes made in the room, similar to Control z The next icon will clear all instances from the room. An instance is like a copy of an object. You don't ever actually put objects in a room, you put clones of the object, and they're called instances. The next icon will shift all of your instances a given amount. This is important if you ever change the size of your room. The next two icons will lock all of your instances or unlock all of your instances. This is important if you're making changes to your room and you don't want to accidentally click and drag your instances around. The next section deals with your grid. Snap X allows you to change the size of each cell in pixels, and Snap Y does the same, but it does it vertically. The next section has two options for your grid. The first button will toggle a basic grid. This is a grid where you have horizontal lines and vertical lines. The next button will turn on an isometric grid. This button gives you diagonal lines. If you're unsure why you'd want to use diagonal lines, some examples of isometric games are Qbert, Baldur's Gate, Mario RPG, Diablo, Simpsons Tapped Out. A lot of RTSs and RPGs use an isometric grid because it gives a nice fake 3D look. If you search online for isometric, you'll probably find some really good pixel art of buildings done in isometric view. Buildings are commonly drawn in isometric views because you get to see two sides at the same time. If you were using a standard grid, you'd only get to see one facing of the building. The next icon is a magnifying glass with a drop-down menu. From here, you can toggle which things are visible inside your room. Maybe you don't want to see your objects, or your backgrounds, or your foregrounds. It might just be getting in the way when you're working with other layers. This would be the place where you would do that. The next three icons just deal with zooming in and out. You can zoom in, out, and then reset the view to a 1 by 1 ratio. Alternatively, you could use your mouse's scroll wheel. The next button deals with something that's a little more advanced. This deals with instance order. Once you have instances of objects in your room, you can change the order in which they are created. This might be important at some point in your game when one object needs another object to exist to trigger some sort of function. Usually this is just done in code, but on the off chance that you do need to change the instance order, this is the place to do it. The last button is actually pretty useful if you're first starting out. It gives you a rundown of all of the different mouse controls. You could open it now and take some time to read over those controls. At the bottom left of the Room Properties window, you'll see sort of a thumbnail or mini-map of your canvas. This gives you an overall preview of your room. If you zoom in closer, an outline box will appear on your mini-map showing you where you're looking. At the very bottom, you'll find your info bar. Here you'll find the X and Y coordinate of your mouse. You can see the numbers change as you move your cursor around the map. This is really useful. As you make more rooms for your game, you'll find that it's very important to understand where all of your objects are being placed. These numbers are dependent on your Snap X and Snap Y at the top. Wherever you rest your mouse cursor, the X and Y coordinates are actually telling you the top left corner of the box that you're mousing over. The rest of the info bar usually gives you information about whatever you're currently working on. Now let's deal with the six tabs on the left side. The first one I like to check whenever I start a new room is Settings. You'll find a Name Text field as your first option. This is where you name your room. This is exactly like naming a sprite or an object. You can use the prefix room, underscore, and then the name of your room. Alternatively, you don't need the underscore. Or you could even just use a short form for room. Personally, I use rm, underscore. Then you'll have the width and height of your room in pixels. This size is not necessarily what the user will see when he boots up the game. You can use the views tab for that, but we'll get into it later. These two text fields just set up how large you want your room. Think of a game like Super Mario World. Mario runs to the right a lot, so the width of his room might actually be thousands of pixels wide. However, at any given time, you only get to see a portion of the room. That would be the view, but like I said, we'll get into it later. The next field is speed. If you saw my lesson on sprites, you'll notice that I've spoken about speed in the past. 
This number, which is defaulted at 30, is how many steps or thoughts or calculations your game will make each second. 30 is usually pretty good. However, if you have a large room or a view, the user might notice that your game looks choppy. This is especially noticeable in high action games. If you find that your game looks kind of choppy, you can set your speed to 60, or higher if you wish. 30 and 60 are usually pretty good numbers for the speed. Once we get into learning GML, you'll notice how these two numbers will change everything else in your game, or at least everything that has to do with the speed. Below speed, you'll find a box for persistent. If the box is not checked, as it is by default, every time you enter this room, it'll be as if you'd never been in the room before. It'll start from scratch. That's actually usually fine. However, if you're making an RPG or a game that has a non-linear, persistent world, you want to turn this checkbox on. This means if a player leaves the room and then re-enters, anything that was affected in the room will stay affected. Enemies will still be dead, or items will still be collected. However, you may not always need to turn it on. Keep in mind though, if you have an object also ticked with persistent, that object will carry room to room, even if you've clicked on the persistent checkbox here in this room. Below persistent, you'll find a button for creation code. We'll get into code later. All you need to know is that this will take place after your room is loaded up and all of your instances have been created, but before the event called room start. So this event is just nestled in between create and room start. Below creation code, you'll find another button for instance order. This is the same as the instance order button on the toolbar. The next tab of importance is backgrounds. The first option is a checkbox for draw background color. If you have it checked, you can click on the box below that says color, and then select a color you'd like the room to have in the background. It's a simple way to just get one flat color for prototyping, or if you need to extend your background for some reason. Keep in mind that if you don't draw a background color, and objects leave your room into the area where no color is drawn, you'll see every single frame of movement and animation in the dead zone of no color. So if your game ever shows the outside of your room, Make sure you draw a background color, otherwise it's not necessary, but for this reason, it's defaulted as on. Below that, we have a menu of 8 backgrounds, background 0 through background 7. This means that you can have 8 different background layers for your room. So to start with, you can just click on one of these background numbers. Then below that, we can change the options for that background. There's a checkbox for visible when room starts. This pretty much does what it sounds. If it's checked, the background will be visible immediately when the room starts. Usually that's what you want. However, if your background ever changes mid-level, don't turn it on. Leave it invisible, and later you can turn it on with code. Below that we have a checkbox for foreground image. This is if you want your background to be in the foreground instead. Remember, all background images are layered below all instances of objects. Nothing can be below it. Similarly, foreground images are above all object instances, and therefore nothing can be on top of a foreground image. Below foreground image you'll find a drop down. Right now it should say no background. If you click the drop down button to the right, you'll get a drop down list of all of the backgrounds you've imported into your resource tree. This is where you select which background you want to associate with this background layer. Below that you have some options for tiling the background. You can decide whether you want to tile it horizontally or tile it vertically. This is really good for limiting your file size. You could make a background that's very small in width and height, but has the ability to be tiled. So you would check tile horizontally and tile vertically. Then you have one large seamless background that goes on forever, but it came from such a small image that your file size for your game is decreased. To the right you'll find a box for X and Y. This is your offset for your background. Here you'll offset the top left corner of your background. You can offset it horizontally and vertically with the X and Y. Below these four options, we have an option for stretch. Once again, if you've used a background image that is smaller than the size of your room, you can click stretch, and the image will stretch to the dimensions of your room. This might not always be ideal because it might make your image look a little shoddy. This is why it's off by default. At the very bottom, you'll have horizontal speed and vertical speed. These are actually some really interesting options to understand. This will set your background or foreground permanently in motion. Imagine a running game where you're always running to the right. Let's say you made some sort of a wind foreground. You could set the horizontal speed to make it look like the foreground is always moving to the left, as if there's wind always blowing over the character. 
You could set a little bit of horizontal speed and vertical speed and use a snow overlay as your foreground image to make it look like it's always snowing in your game. You can even make your background move constantly. Most of the time you just want your background to be static and just let it move with the camera as your player moves around the room. This is why it's defaulted at zero and zero, no speed. But it's important to understand that you can animate your background and foreground. The next tab we'll look at is objects. When we first click on the objects tab, we can ignore the top section and go right down to the drop down button. From here, we can select any object we've created for our game. Once you do, the name of your object will appear in the text field on the left side of the drop down button. Above it, you'll see a preview of the image for your object. Now that you have this object selected, you can move your cursor over to your canvas and click to place it anywhere on your map. If you have a value for snap X or snap Y, your object will snap the origin of the sprite to the grid. Once it's placed, you can manipulate this instance or clone of this object. You can grab either of the four handles and stretch the instance, or you could just use the text fields in the panel on the left. You can scale the X, which is make it wider or thinner, and you can scale the Y, which makes the object taller or smaller. You can change the rotation all the way through 360 degrees. You can change the alpha, which is the transparency of this object. And you can change the color. This is kind of like a color overlay. So white means there's no color overlay. But if for some reason you did want to overlay this particular instance with a color, you could select it here. Also, you can simply flip the object on its X axis or its Y axis. The important thing to do now and understand about the objects tab is you can go ahead and place more than one object. This places multiple instances of that one object you created in your resource tree. Each instance will act according to however you set up the behaviors for your object in your resource tree. Each instance will follow the same behavior, unless you've coded it to do something different depending on certain variables. If you want to fine tune the placement of your object, Instead of clicking and releasing, you can click and hold and drag your object around, then release when you're ready to go. Also, you can click and drag any object you've already placed in the room and pick a new spot. If you need to know some more mouse controls, the very bottom of the panel on the left for the objects tab gives you those controls. Let's play around with a couple of them right now. Let's click and hold on one of our objects and start dragging it around. As we drag it around, it should snap to the grid. If we hold the Alt key, we can ignore the snap. If we hold shift and control, instead of clicking down and dragging a new instance, we'll constantly place multiple instances. This is a really quick way to just lay down a whole bunch of instances. If you hold down just the shift key and you click on an instance, then click on another instance, you start creating a bounding box that'll select all of the instances inside. You can use this whenever you need to manipulate a whole bunch of instances at the same time. If you want to place an instance on top of another instance, but you'll find that clicking on it just selects the instance, you can hold the control key. This will ignore selecting an instance and then just place one on top. The problem with this is you might end up with a whole bunch of instances on top of each other and you don't want that. If you'd rather just have one instance, you can use the checkbox that says delete underlying. This means that whenever you click to add a new instance and it intersects with a previously placed instance, that previously placed instance will be deleted. It's a good failsafe for not overlapping instances and ending up with more than you bargained for. If you right click on an instance, you get a huge drop down menu. But if you look at just the first two, we can select delete or delete all objects under cursor. So if you didn't have delete underlying check marked and you had a whole stack of instances on top of each other, you can select delete all objects under cursor and this will delete the entire stack. However, there are a couple of things you can do with right click. If you hold shift and right click on an instance, this will delete all layered instances. It's similar to right clicking and then selecting delete all objects under cursor. If you find it tedious right clicking and then selecting delete from a drop down menu, you can hold down the control key and then you can just right click on any instance to delete it immediately. You can also hold down right click and then sweep over instances to just paint delete them. I've already mentioned that you can use your scroll wheel to zoom in and out, but if you use the click of your scroll wheel, you can grab your map and start panning around. As with similar programs, you can use control C and control V to copy and paste whichever instance you currently have selected. The selected one is denoted by the four anchor points at each corner. 
You now understand the basics of creating a room. There are three more tabs in the panel on the left. Those are Tiles, Views, and Physics. These are a little more advanced, and we'll get into them in later lessons. But for now, you have a great basic knowledge of how rooms work.